What's up, guys? I've got a pretty awesome story for you here from the book Beasts, Men, and Gods by Dr. Olsendowski. The first printing of this was in August 1922, and then the second printing in September of 1922, so it must have done really well. And just so you know, contemporaries of his did question the veracity of his story. He did have artifacts from Tibet, and it, everything seemed to check out with him. And back in this time frame, if somebody got famous off of a pretty extraordinary story and you could prove them wrong, then you would get fame for being the one that proved this guy was a hoax. Nowadays, people get upset with you if you point out that somebody is absolutely full of it. <laughs> it's part of that demoralization, kids. But this guy did pass the acid test. He was fleeing the Soviet Reds, you know, around the Dub Dub One era. And part of his flight to freedom led him through Tibet. And so we're going to jump ahead to, uh, I think, the fifth chapter. And spoiler alert, we're, we're going to be talking about beings that live inside of the Earth. And I want to point out that there's hollow Earth theory, and then there's inner Earth theory, and... Uh, as far as I'm concerned, you're talking about two totally different things. Hollow Earth theorizes that there's a central sun. Um, there was a book called The, ha the Smoky God of uh, like a Viking type dude that accidentally got sucked into Agartha. And both theories use the same name of the city there, Agartha. But this theory, you have to believe that the interior of the Earth is concaved. And, you know, between us and them, there's, what, a couple hundred miles of material, and then it's all hollow from there with a central sun. There's supposed to be two openings at the poles, and I don't know. That could be the case, but that is hollow earth theory. Now, let's talk about inner earth theory, where you, we're not talking about the shape of anything. We're just saying that there are beings that live inside of the earth. These could be natural caves. They could be man-made, being-made, whatever these things are. But we've got underground cities all around the world like Darren Kuyu. And there are thousands and thousands of miles of natural caves. Also, what are the bigwigs doing right now, you know, to prepare for a worst-case scenario? They're digging underground bunkers, right? And have been for a long time. We had that whole Cold War scenario and yeah, they spent a lot of money tunneling into mountains over some technology that I question very much. I've talked in depth on this channel about the disaster cycles. Well, what if a civilization from thousands of years ago did the exact same thing that we would do today if we thought that there was oh, something going to smack us from the sky or something like that? Right now, we have the technology to be able to set up a geodome permaculture, self-sustaining underground environment. Theoretically, you could have tens to hundreds of square miles set up next to an underground lake. And if you really think about it, providing electricity for that setup to be able to have grow lights and everything like that wouldn't be that difficult because you just use geothermal. So I just wanted to put that on the table that inner earth doesn't necessarily have to mean hollow earth. And I want to point out that every ancient culture has the mythology of the underground. The Mayan had Shibalba, which is really close to the Chinese Shambhala. The Greeks had Tartarus. The Hopi Indians speak of the ant people that they went down and lived with to survive a catastrophe. And I've even seen Agartha written as Asgartha, which is a lot like the Viking... Asgard. And I haven't been able to verify this, but supposedly they did have a myth of the gods living somewhere on an island over in Central Asia. So there's a lot to this theory, and it even covers the Homo Lizardus, which we will be getting into. Okay, so Osandowski fled Russia, and we'll skip over to where it starts getting good. The mystery of mysteries, the king of the world. Stop whispered my Mongol guide as we were one day crossing the plain near Sagan Luk. Stop. He slipped from his camel, which lay down without his bidding. The Mongol raised his hands in prayer before his face and began to repeat the sacred phrase, 
Om Mani Padme Hung. The other Mongols immediately stopped their camels and began to pray. What has happened, I thought. The Mongols prayed for some time, whispered among themselves, and after tightening up the packs on the camels, moved on. Did you see, asked the Mongol, how our camels moved their ears in fear? How the herd of horses on the plain stood fixed in attention, and how the herds of sheep and cattle lay crouched close to the ground? Did you notice that the birds did not fly? The marmots did not run, the dogs did not bark? The air trembled softly and bore from afar the music of a song which penetrated to the hearts of men, animals, and birds alike. Earth and sky ceased breathing. The wind did not blow and the sun did not move. At such a moment, the wolf that is stealing up on the sheep arrests its stealthy crawl. The frightened herd of antelope suddenly checks its wild course. The knife of the shepherd cutting the sheep's throat falls from his hand. The rapacious ermine ceases to stalk the unsuspecting salga. Because everybody knows what that is. All living beings in fear are involuntarily thrown into prayer and waiting for their fate. So it was just now. Thus it has always been, whenever the king of the world in his subterranean palace prays and searches out the destiny of all peoples on the earth. He talks about his journey moving on and then uh, running into some other people. And he says, The old people on the shore of the river Emil related to me an ancient legend to the effect that a certain Mongolian t- tribe in their escape from the demands of Gen- Genghis Khan hid themselves in a subterranean country. Afterwards, a soyot from the from near the lake of Nogankul, showed me the smoking gate that serves as the entrance to the kingdom of Agartai. Through this gate, a hunter formally entered into the kingdom, and after his return began to relate what he had seen there. The lamas cut out his tongue, lama is in the Dalai Lama, the priest, uh, in order to prevent him from telling about the mystery of mysteries. When he arrived at old age, he came back to the entrance of this cave and disappeared into the subterranean kingdom, the memory of which had ornamented and lightened his nomad heart. I received more realistic information about this from Hutuktu in Narabanchi Kur. He told me the story of the semi-realistic arrival of the powerful king of the world from his subterranean kingdom, of his appearance, of his miracles, and of his prophecies. And only then did I begin to understand that in that legend, hypnosis or mass vision, whichever it may be, is hidden not only mystery, but a realistic and powerful force capable of influencing the course of political life in Asia. From that moment, I began making some investigations. The favorite Jilong Lama of the prince and the prince himself gave me an account of the subterranean kingdom. Everything in the world, said the Jilong, is constantly in a state of change and transition. Peoples, science, religions, laws, and customs. How many great empires and brilliant cultures have perished? And that alone which remains unchanged is evil, the tool of bad spirits. More than 60,000 years ago, a holy man disappeared with a whole tribe of people under the ground and never appeared on the surface of the earth again. Many people, however, have since visited this kingdom, and he names five people specifically here. I can't pronounce them. No one knows where this place is. One says Afghanistan, others India. All the people there are protected against evil and crimes do not exist within its borns. Science has there developed calmly and nothing is threatened with destruction. The subterranean people which have reached the highest knowledge. Now it is a large kingdom. Millions of men with the king of the world as their ruler. He knows all the forces of the world and reads all the souls of humankind and the great book of their destiny. Invisibly, he rules 800 million men on the surface of the earth and they will accomplish his every order. See, this covers a lot of bases here. 
The prince says, this kingdom is Agartai. It extends throughout all the subterranean passages of the whole world. I heard a learned lama of China relating to Bagdo Khan that all the subterranean caves of America are inhabited by the ancient people who have disappeared underground. Traces of them are still found on the surface of the land. These subterranean peoples and spaces are governed by rulers owing allegiance to the king of the world. You know that in the two greatest oceans of the east and the west, there were formerly two continents. They disappeared under the water, but their people went into the subterranean kingdom. In underground caves, there exists a peculiar light which affords growth to the grains and vegetables and long life without disease to people. See, they got their grow lights set up. Uh, there are many different peoples and many different tribes. An old Buddhist Brahmin in Nepal met a fisherman who ordered him to take a place in his boat and sail with him upon the sea. On the third day, they reached the island where he met a people having two tongues which could speak separately in different languages. They showed him peculiar, unfamiliar animals, tortoises with 16 feet and one eye, huge snakes with a very tasty flesh, and birds with teeth which caught fish for their masters in the sea. These people told him that they had come up out of the subterranean kingdom and described to him certain parts of the underground country. Traveling on later, the Lama Turgut told him the capital of, Gar of Agartai is surrounded with towns of high priests and scientists. It reminds one of Lhasa where the palace of the Dalai Lama, the Potala, is the top of a mountain covered with monasteries and temples. The throne of the king of the world is surrounded by millions of incarnate, incarnated gods. They are the holy panditas. The palace itself is encircled by the palaces of the Goro, who possess all the visible and invisible forces of the earth, of inferno, of the sky, and who can do everything for life and death of man. If our mad humankind should begin a war against them, they would be able to explode the whole surface of our planet and transform it into deserts. And perhaps they have. Sodom and Gomorrah, anyone? They can dry up seas, transform lands into oceans, and scatter the mountains into the sands of the deserts. By his order, trees, grasses, and bushes can be made to grow. Old and feeble men can become young and stalwart and the dead can be resurrected. In cars strange and unknown to us, they rush through the narrow cleavages inside our planet. Some Indian Brahmins and Tibetan Dalai Lamas, during their laborious struggles to the peaks of mountains which no other human feet have trod, have found their inscriptions carved on the rocks, footprints in the snow, and tracks of wheels. The blissful Sakamoni found on the mountain top uh, tablets of stone carrying words which he only understood in his old age and afterwards penetrated into the kingdom of Agartai, from which he brought back crumbs of the sacred learning preserved in his memory. There in palaces of wonderful crystal live the invisible rulers of all pious people, sorry, pious people, the king of the world, or Brahitma, who can speak with God as I speak with you, and his two assistants, the Mahitma, knowing the purposes of the future events, and Mahinga, ruling the causes of those events. The holy Panditas studied the world and all its forces. Sometimes the most learned among them collect together and send envoys to that place where human eyes have never penetrated. This is described by the Tashi Lama living 850 years ago. The highest panditas place their hands on their eyes and at the base of the brain of younger ones and force them into a deep sleep, wash their bodies in an infusion of grass and make them immune to pain and harder than stones. They wrap them in magic clothes, bind them, and then pray to the great god. The petrified youths lie with their eyes and ears open and alert, 
seeing, hearing, and remembering everything. Afterwards, a guru approaches and fastens a long, steady gaze upon them. Very slowly, the bodies lift themselves from the earth and disappear. The guru sits and stares with fixed eyes to the place where he has sent them. Invisible threads join them to his will. Some of them course among the stars, observe their events, their unknown peoples, their life, and their laws. They listen to their talk, read their books, understand their fortunes and woes, their holiness and sins, their piety and evil. Some are mingled with the flame and see that creature of fire, quick and ferocious, eternally fighting, melting and hammering metals in the depths of the planets, boiling the water for geysers and springs, melting the rocks and pushing out molten streams over the surface of the earth through the holes in the mountains. Others rush together with the ever-elusive, infinitesimally small, transparent creatures of the air and penetrate into the mysteries of their existence and into the purposes of their life. Others slip into the depths of the sea and observe the kingdom of the wise creatures of the water who transport and spread genial warmth all over the earth, ruling the winds, waves, and storms. Now, that's actually dropping some pretty advanced knowledge for, I, I would think, for 1922 because the whole earth's atmosphere and conditions are dependent on ocean conveyor belts. So that to me seems like some pretty advanced scientific knowledge right there. And I don't think that would have been widely known if this guy was making this up. And that's a pretty interesting shamanistic spirit journey kind of thing that he's talking about there, that these people went to the stars and to the depths of the oceans and their consciousness was able to go everywhere. It reminds me a lot of what I've heard about shamanism, which is another uh, another system that believes in the underground. I remember hearing a story of a shaman riding his drum into the underworld. Anyway, I think that's a pretty good appetizer to the Inner Earth Buffet. And one of the few theories from YouTube that has stood the test of time with me, anyway. I still believe that the catastrophe cycles is a real thing, but it's been heavily diluted on here. And, you know, I heard someone wiser than me once say that if you're looking for, for the truth, things should become clearer as you move towards the truth. And unfortunately, with most everything I see on YouTube these days, it's getting, it's muddying the waters, so, so to speak. But apparently at the highest levels of Buddhism, they believe that there is a society that escaped a cataclysm by going underground thousands of years ago. And even though they are scientifically and technologically advanced, that's not what they hang their hat on. Their spirituality is a major focus for them. And that's where we've lost our way in today's world. There's either science or there's spirituality. And it's two separate paths where they join the two. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I will see you on the next one. Static out.